Hey everybody, this is Pastor Brian Ross from Grace Life Bible Church in Grand Rapids, Michigan. And I want to come to you uh, in another week here with a midweek video, <clears throat> continuing our series, The Word for All Ages. If you haven't already done so, I'd like to ask you to uh, click the subscribe and alarm bell so that you can uh, stay current with the ministry here as far as when we go live and uh, drop new videos during the week. I'm trying to release at least one video midweek. Uh, usually I'm, I'm shooting for a Thursday morning release <clears throat> moving forward. So if you haven't already done that, if you'd subscribe and click the alarm bell for updates, we would appreciate that. I'm very happy to announce the release of my new book. This is just coming out. This came out yesterday on May 3rd. Today is May 4th, and it's my book, The Preservation of God's Word, A Close Look at Psalm 12, 6, and 7. So this is being published again by Dispensational Publishing House. Right now, the only way you can obtain it is to order a paperback copy. It's $5. It's not a super long book, but it is related to whether or not the Psalms, Psalm 12, 6, and 7, are teaching the preservation of the Word of God. And so we're, uh, we're pleased to announce that and offer that book. So uh, if you would consider doing it, I'll put a link in the description uh, to that. Consider checking that out and picking up a copy and uh, adding that to your library. Also, I want to remind you about our Rumble channel, Grace Life Bible Church on Rumble. We're up one more subscriber than where we were last week when we had 53. And again, we're establishing this as an alt tech site, as an alternative to YouTube, should we need to uh, go there uh, and use that. So last week, I did a study on the issue of does preservation require verbatim identicality of wording, okay? And that was part five in this series that I've been doing on the issue of the word for all ages. And we looked at two passages. We looked at a passage in Luke chapter four, and we looked at a passage in Acts chapter eight, where the in the case of Luke four, the Lord Jesus Christ, in the case of Acts eight, it's the Ethiopian eunuch. They are reading a manuscript copy of the book of Isaiah, and yet there is not an identic match. There's not a verbatimly identical match to the way it reads in the Old Testament of the King James, okay? So that's what we were talking about. And I was I was trying to make the point that preservation does not require verbatim identicality of wording and is trying to establish a scriptural biblical argument for making that case. And remember that there are differences of at, uh, at every level of this conversation. There are no two Greek manuscripts, no two printed editions of the Text Receptus, no two publications of the, of the uh, King James Bible that have verbatim identicality, that have Xeroxed identicality. And I was trying to put forth a scriptural evaluation of how to think about that issue last week in Lesson 5. <clears throat> now, in doing that, we looked at this passage here from Luke chapter 4. This is where Jesus is in the synagogue in Nazareth, and he uh, goes into the synagogue, and he, he stands up for to read, and there's delivered to him a copy of the book of Isaiah, and he finds the place where it is written. And he reads here from Isaiah 61. It's recorded here in Luke chapter 4. And notice the bolded differences in wording. We went over all of these last time, indicating sub, indicating wording differences. So not Xerox identicality, not verbatim identicality, but substantive, but substantive agreement as far as the doctrinal content is concerned. And then there's this statement here. In Luke chapter two, verse Luke chapter four, verse eighteen, that does not appear in Isaiah chapter sixty-one, verse uh, verse one. I've got a bolded and underlined it here. This this phrase here, the recovery of sight to the blind. This prompted a question on that video in the comments from a gentleman named David West. I don't have no idea who uh, David is. He has commented a few other times on some of our other videos. Uh, I appreciate his comment. But he's asking the question, but we are not comparing a Masoretic edition, 10th century, of the Old Testament to an LXX edition or Greek translation of the Old Testament in Jesus' day. So what David West here is doing is he's bringing up the question. Well, whoops, didn't want to show you that yet. I want to go back here. Sorry about that. He's bringing up the question, is, G is the reason why this phrase is added here in Luke chapter 4, verse 18, because the Lord Jesus Christ is reading from the LXX or the Septuagint or the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. OK, so that's the question that that David is raising there. OK, if you go down also into the comments, uh, another brother, Steve Hayes from Idaho, he also asks this question. 
He says, thanks, Brian. This is Steve Hayes from Idaho. Great lesson. Some important points made from the King James Bible itself. I do have a question. Much has been made of how the New Testament quotes the Old Testament. Modern text critics often argue that there is a difference in the New Testament quotation because it is quoting the Greek LXX rather than translating the Hebrew scriptures. Personally, I do not believe this to be the case, but have you looked to see if there is anything to this assertion relative to Luke 4 and Acts 8 quotations that you used in your presentation? So two times in the uh, interaction with the video from last week, and I, I like the interaction, I, I really do, the issue of the LXX, the Septuagint, has come up, okay? Now, let me say, I remember being in Bible college, and every everyone wanted to talk about the Septuagint, the uh, supposed translation of the Hebrew Old Testament into Greek, and it was asserted time and time and time again that Jesus and the apostles, they all used the Septuagint. That they were using this Greek translation of the Old Testament. They were not using the Hebrew Scriptures, and it is commonly said that um, that is accounting for the, the differences in wording like we saw here, right? Well, so this prompted me, these questions prompted me to look into this and put together this video. And I'm not claiming that this video is going to be sort of exhaustive or cumulative of everything that could be said, but it, it is uh, some things to consider and ponder on nonetheless, okay? So what I did is I added another column to this table. So here we have these two columns are the same as what we saw in the video from last week right here. But now I've gone an extra step and I've added the LXX column here. Okay, now I have a copy of the Septuagint, the Septuagint Greek and English Old Testament. I got this from uh, Pastor Brother Lee Hamoki when he uh, passed away last summer. It was in his library. And so I was uh, real keen to uh, swoop that up and make that a part of my own library. So we look. We can look at the LXX here, and we can see that the the phrase, the recovery and the recovering of sight to the blind, that was missing there is in the LXX. But then notice that the LXX is missing this phrase, to set at liberty them that are bruised. So I think we can conclude from that pretty conclusively that Jesus Christ in the synagogue in Nazareth is not reading from the LXX. If he was reading from the LXX, then he would have had this phrase. Now, I am pondering a lot about how to think about this issue here in Luke chapter 4, and that's probably the subject for another video, but I think we can say pretty conclusively that the Lord Jesus Christ is not reading from an LXX, from a Septuagint, when he is in the synagogue in Nazareth, because, again, there are phrases missing from the Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament, okay? Now, when I was in Bible college, and I was going through Bible College, I picked up a copy of the Christian's Handbook of Manuscript Evidence by Peter S. Ruckman. Okay, Now, chapter 4 in this book, Ruckman has a chapter called the Mythological LXX, where he argues that the Septuagint, that the LXX, is a myth. Okay, And that always, I always wondered about that because there were books in the library that said Septuagint on them. Okay, And so I was always wondering, like, what... How could it be a myth if, you know, there's a book in the library called the Septuagint? Well, so that's sort of been a thing that, and it's come up from time to time over the years uh, in ministry, but nothing too significant, okay? So recently, uh, Brother David Daniels of Chick Publication uh, published this book, Did Jesus Use the Septuagint? And he also did a vlog series here. And I'm going to put links to both the book where you can order the book and to the vlog into the description on this video. And his vlog is, was there a B.C. Septuagint? Okay. So this is a question that has been on the table for a long time. I think we can see pretty clearly here that Jesus is not reading from the Septuagint in um, Luke in Luke chapter 4. Okay. Because it's not, there's a phrase missing from the Septuagint. So this phrase is there in the Septuagint, but this phrase is not, right? So what's going on here? And why would Jesus and the apostles, why would they even want to or feel the need to use a Septuagint, if such thing exists, that, and not a Hebrew Old Testament, okay? So let's talk about a couple things. So first thing I want to say, as far as there being a B.C. Septuagint, there is zero, there is no extant manuscript evidence 
of the existence of a BC Septuagint. Anything that we have claiming to be the Septuagint is coming from sources that date from the eight from AD, from after the time of Christ. Okay, this Septuagint right here, this Septuagint that's put together. Let me just show you. It's got the Greek in the center, and then it's got the English translation along the margins on both pages. This is put together, guys, from some combination of Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus and Codex Alexandrinus, all of which date from after the time of Christ. So these books that you can go buy, if you go to christianbook.com, if you go to the library, if you go wherever, they are not coming from any known B.C. textual witness or evidence. They are combined, they are combined edited works pulling from Codex Vaticanus, Codex Sinaiticus, and Codex Alexandrinus, okay? Now, Brother Daniels at Chick Publications, he does an excellent job chronicling all of that in his book and also in his series. Now, that's getting very technical, and uh, I'm not going to get into all of that with you here right now. But there is no extant manuscript evidence of a B.C. Septuagint. Yet, well, I have a book right here claiming to be the Septuagint. It's put together from sources that date from after the time of Christ, okay? The story of the Septuagint's existence, which is I, what I believe led Ruckman to say that it was mythological, is based upon a letter that, uh, the letter of uh, Aristarchus, I think I'm saying that right, I might be saying it wrong, which purports that 70 or 72, depending on which account you read, Jewish scholars were, you know, went to, um, w went to Alexandria and they all translated the, the, um, the, uh, Greek, he, the Hebrew uh, Old Testament into Greek. Then there's legendary stories about how these guys were all locked locked in their individual cell and they were given the task to translate um, from Hebrew into Greek. And that all 70 of them to a man came up with this exact same identical translation of the Hebrew into Greek. Okay. These stories, folks, are just way too far fetched. Okay. So all of the evidence that we have for the Septuagint is dating from after the time of Christ, yet the scholars want us to believe that there was a Septuagint in existence at the time of Christ, and not only in existence at the time of Christ, but it was used by Christ and the apostles during the earthly ministry and during the writing of the New Testament documents, the New Testament books, okay? So I want to I explore the validity of that on two fronts in this video. I'm going to let, I'm going to commend to you Daniel's book here, Did Jesus Use a Septuagint, for issues related to the history and running some of those things down. I'm not going to get into all those things here. He does an excellent job covering them in the book, and they're sort of superfluous to what I want to, to what I want to get into, okay? So, the first point I want to look at is some, is some scriptural arguments, then I want to look some, at some textual evidence. So, let's look at the scriptural arguments first, okay? So, here we have Esther chapter 8, verse 9. Let me give you the context, okay? This is when the, the Persians are in charge. So Israel and Judah have been led away captive. They've gone through the 70-year Babylonian captivity. They are currently under the, now the Persians. The Persians are running things. It's under the reign of Persia that Nehemiah and Zerubbabel are allowed to go back to Jerusalem and to start rebuilding the wall there, etc., and, and the temple and whatnot, Okay. So here we are now, we're, we're, we're well past the 70-year Babylonian captivity, we're into the Persian captivity, and you know the story of Esther, I'm not going to retell, retell the whole story, but the king's decree avenges the Jews, okay? So I want you to notice something here, okay? Look at verse 9, Esther chapter 8, verse 9. Then were the king's scribes called, called at that time in the third month, that is in the month of Sibian, on the third and twentieth day thereof, and it was according to all that Mordecai commanded unto the Jews, and to the lieutenants, and to the deputies, and to the rulers of the provinces, which are from India unto Ethiopia, unto, uh, and hundred twenty and set a hundred twenty and seven provinces, unto every province according to the writing thereof. Now watch, and unto every people after their language, and to the Jews according to their writing. And according to their language. So the Jewish nation has been in captivity for over 70 years, and notice they are keeping 
the tradition of their elders, and they are reading and writing still in the language of their forefathers. They have not just adopted the Gentile languages for their religious observance and for their practice. They are still writing, they are still reading according to their language, which would have been the Hebrew language, okay? Now, after the Persian Empire, we would have the Greek Empire, followed by the Romans, right? But here we have an Old Testament reference to well past the Babylonian captivity of 70 years into the Persian captivity, referring to the fact that the Jews are still using their language. They are still writing, they are still reading the lang their language, which would have been the Hebrew language, okay? We also know from the Apostle Paul in Romans chapter 3, verses 1 and 2, that one of the chief advantages in time past of being an Israelite was the fact that God, God entrusted the oracles of God to the Jewish nation. Okay, Look at Romans chapter 3, verse 1. What advantage then hath the Jew, or what profit is there of circumcision? Much every way, chiefly, the chief reason, because that unto them were committed the oracles of God. So the, one of the major advantages that Israel had in time past was that God had committed his oracles, his word, his writings unto the Jewish nation. And what language did he give them in? He gave them in Hebrew. So the Hebrew people are very protective of the fact that God communicated unto them the oracles of God. And like we saw here in the Esther passage, they are still cognizant and aware to be maintaining and reading and writing in the Hebrew language, in the language of their forefathers, okay? Then we come over to the book of Matthew, and notice when Jesus Christ is <clears throat> referring to the law, notice what he says in Matthew chapter 5, verse, seven, verse 17. Think not that I am come to destroy the law or the prophets. I am not come to destroy, but to fulfill. For verily I say unto you, till heaven and earth pass, one jot or one tittle shall in no wise pass from the law till all be fulfilled. So when the Lord Jesus Christ is talking about the law, he's talking about the law in it, it, as it exists in Hebrew. The jots and the tittles are punctuation marks, etc., related to the Hebrew language. So the Lord Jesus Christ is not speaking about the Old Testament in Greek terms. He's speaking about the Old Testament using Hebrew terminology talking about the pieces of the Hebrew language. So we start stacking biblical arguments together now. We see what happened with the Jews in the captivity in the book of Esther. We see that they had an advantage, a chief advantage in time past because the oracles of God were committed unto them. We see the Lord Jesus Christ here, and he is talking about the aspects of the Hebrew alphabet, not the Greek alphabet, when he's talking about the law. We could also go to Luke chapter 4, verse 16, which is the passage that uh, kind of started this conversation last week. And we see that Jesus, and when he came to Nazareth, where he had been brought up, and as his custom was, he went into the synagogue on the Sabbath day and stood up for it to read. Well, I already showed you that he is not handed the LXX. He's handed, and I believe, a Hebrew Old Testament, a Hebrew copy of the book of Isaiah in this case, okay? So we, we're building a scriptural argument based upon scriptural observations. We can also go, folks, to Luke chapter 24, verse 44. This is after the resurrection. Notice what it says. And he said unto them, These are the words which I spake unto you while I was yet with you, that all things must be fulfilled which were written in the law of Moses and in the prophets and in the Psalms concerning me. When Jesus Christ opens the eyes of the apostles to cause them to understand things after his resurrection, he specifically mentions here the threefold division of the Hebrew scriptures, the, the law, the prophets, and the Psalms. He is not talking about it using Greek or Septuagint terminology. And notice also that he is not mentioning the Apocrypha. Now, the Apocrypha is in the Septuagint. The Septuagint contains the apocryphal books. The apocryphal books were never accepted as canon by the Jewish nation. And Jesus Christ does not reference the apocryphal books. So when Christ talks about the Old Testament, he talks about the jots and the tittles, and he talks about the threefold Hebrew division of the Old Testament. There's no scriptural reason to me why we should think that Jesus and the apostles are using a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament 
during the period that the New Testament was written. The Septuagint contains the Apocrypha, and the Apocrypha is not mentioned here as one of the, the components of the Hebrew Scripture by the Lord Jesus Christ. And I don't know about you, but I tend to think that Jesus Christ knows what he's talking about, okay? Now, we could come over to Acts 26 as well, okay? In Acts 26, in this passage, Paul is recounting what happened to him on the road to Damascus, okay? And we know that on the road to Damascus, he met Christ in the way, and that he's, Christ spoke to Saul of Tarsus on the road to Damascus. Look at Acts 26, verse 14. And when we were fallen, and when we were fallen to the earth, I heard a voice speaking unto me and saying, In the Hebrew tongue, Saul, Saul, why persecutest thou me? It is hard for thee to kick against the pricks. So when the Lord Jesus Christ shows up on the road to Damascus and, and interrupts the wild career of Saul of Tarsus, what language does he speak to him in? The text is very clear in the New Testament that Christ spoke to Paul, or Saul at the time, in Hebrew, not Greek. So we see that the Hebrew language was still a very big deal at this time, okay? Now, we could also go and look at Acts chapter 21, okay? Come with me, look at Acts 21. Now, let me see if I can uh, reposition that there a little bit. There we go. Acts 21, look at verse 27. And when, this is talking about when Paul was uh, in the temple. And when the seven days were almost ended, the Jews which were of Asia, now watch, when they saw him in the temple, stirred up the people and laid hands on him. So these are Jews of Asia, okay? They see him, they see Paul in the temple, and they stir up the people and they arrest him. Okay, so I'm going to drop down now for the sake of time to verse 37. Now watch. And as Paul was was to be led into the castle, he said unto the chief captain, May I speak unto thee, who said, Canst thou speak Greek? Art not thou that Egyptian, which before these days made us an uproar and led us out into the wilderness 4,000 men that were murderers? But Paul said, I am a man, which am a Jew of Tarsus, a city of Sicily, a citizen of no mean city. I beseech thee, suffer me to speak unto the people. Now look at verse 40. And when he had given him license, Paul stood on the stairs and beckoned with his hand unto the people. And when there was made a great silence, he spake unto them in the Hebrew tongue, saying, so when you triangulate the verses, the scriptural verses from the Bible, from the Word of God, I don't see any scriptural argument for why Jesus Christ and the 12 apostles and the Apostle Paul later on are using or speaking or quoting from a Greek translation of the Hebrew Old Testament. The Lord Jesus Christ mentions the jots and tittles. He mentions the threefold division of the Hebrew scripture. He speaks to Saul of Tarsus on the Damascus Road in Hebrew. Paul in the in Jerusalem here and is, is speaking unto all of these Jews in the Hebrew tongue. And you know, we could we could go to the next chapter and we could also look at verse, we could go to Acts chapter 22 now. And uh, we could look here at verse 2. We could look at verse 2. Well, we'll start at verse 1. Men and brethren and fathers, hear my defense, which I make now unto you. And when they heard that he spake in the Hebrew tongue to them, they kept more silence, and he saith. So I don't see any scriptural reason for why we should think that Jesus Christ and the 12 apostles, including the apostle Paul, we're reading from, quoting from, or citing things from a Greek New Testament, especially a Greek New Testament that contains the Apocrypha, writings that were never scriptural, never canonical, according to the Jewish, uh, Jew, the Jewish understanding of Scripture. Okay, so those are the scriptural arguments. Okay, that 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 I would like to lay out there. Okay, now the next thing that I want to get into is some textual evidence. So, if Jesus is not reading from the LXX, okay, if the scriptures point to the fact that Jesus and the 12 apostles were all using Hebrew, then what's going on with the Septuagint, and why should we refuse to believe that there was a B.C. Septuagint? Okay, now, let me be very clear about this. 
Do I believe that it, that a document called the Septuagint exists? Well, of course I believe that it exists because I'm holding it in my hand. The question is, is this document a BC document? Was this document in existence before or at the time of Christ, or did it come into existence after the time of Christ? Okay, so let's look at that a little bit, and I want to, to do that. Let's go to Romans chapter 3. Okay, let's go to Romans chapter 3. And let's look here, starting at verse. Now, notice what it says. Even in the Blue Letter Bible, there's a notation here that some of this is coming from Psalms chapter 14. Okay, so we'll, we'll look at that here in a minute. All right. So look at verse 9. What then, this is Paul now, at, at Romans chapter 3. What then are we better than they? No one no wise, for we have before proved both Jews and Gentiles that they are all under sin. As it is written, there is none righteous, no, not one. There is uh, none that understandeth. There is none that seeketh after God. All right, so let's go look here now at Psalms, the cutout. I appreciate this being here. The, f the fool has said in his heart, there is, there is no God. They are corrupt. They have done abominable works. The Lord looked down from heaven upon the children of men to see if there were any that did understand and seek God. They are all gone aside. They are all together become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one. So notice that the quotation here from in Romans chapter 3, verses uh, 10, 11, and 12 is from Psalm chapter 14, verses 1 through 3. And notice that Psalm chapter 14, verse 3 ends after the statement, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. Okay. And then notice here, verse, verse 12 there is none that there is none that doeth good no not one so romans third romans chapter 3 verse 12 is obviously a cross reference to psalms chapter 14 oops i didn't want to do that yet sorry about that it's obviously a cross reference to psalms chapter 14 verse 3 okay now hopefully hopefully you can see that very plainly so let me just show you again verse 12 ends there's none that doeth good no not one Psalm 14, verse 3, there is none that doeth good, no, not one. And then period, that's where verse 3 ends, okay? So then that means then that verses 13 through 18, let's read them. Their throat is an open sepulcher, with their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. Their feet are swift to shed blood. Destruction and misery are in their ways. In the way of peace they have not known, there is no fear of God before their eyes." So that means verses 13 through 18 are taken from somewhere else, not Psalm chapter 14, verse 3. Okay, so let's just go look at it again. Psalm chapter 14, verse 3, you'll notice that it ends where Romans chapter, um, Romans chapter 3, verse 12 ends, right? Look at verse 3. There's They're all gone aside. There are other to become filthy. There is none that doeth good, no, not one, right? So Verse 3, boom, period, no, not one, ends there, right where Romans chapter 3, verse 12 ends. And then Romans chapter 13, verse 18, these verses right in here, okay, 1, 2, 3, 4, 5, these six verses are taken from somewhere else. They're not from Psalm 14, okay? Now you say, why are you making a big deal about this, okay? Well, it's a very big deal in determining the age of the Septuagint. And in fact, I will argue here that it is the smoking gun. It is the piece of evidence that proves beyond a shadow of a doubt that there was no B.C. Septuagint and that the Septuagint had to have been created after Paul wrote the book of Romans. Now, why would I say that? I just showed you, right? Psalm 14, verse 3 ends after the phrase, no, not one. Romans chapter 3, verse 12 is quoting that verse, and it ends with the phrase, no, not one, period. Just like we see here, okay? No, not one, period. Okay, now let's go look at the LXX. Let's go look at the Septuagint. So I've taken a picture, I have a digital copy of this. So what I'm about to show you is the inside of this book. Let's go look at it, okay? So here in this corner, here we have, this is Psalm 14, verse 3. 
They're all gone out of the way. They're together become unprofitable. Uh, sorry, I'm, can't, I'm subconsciously reading King James. So let me start that again. They're all gone out of the way. They are together become good for nothing. There is none that does good. No, not one period. Now, where does the King James, where does that verse end in your King James Bible? It ends right there. No, not one, right? This is Psalm 4. It ends right there. But notice what the Septuagint has done. The Septuagint has taken the contents, folks. It has taken the contents. Let me get the right screen here. Of these six verses, Romans chapter 3, verse 13 through Romans chapter 3, verse 18, it has taken the contents of those six verses and inserted them into Psalm 14, verse 3 in the so-called Septuagint. Notice, we'll start again. They are all gone out of the way. They are together become good for nothing. There is none that does good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Now that's not, that's getting in now. Their throat is an open sepulcher. Notice, where's that? That's verse 13. So the Septuagint just put Romans 3.13 into Psalm chapter 14, verse 3, when it wasn't there previous. Okay, so let's keep going. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they have used deceit. The poison of asps is under their lips, whose mouth is full of cursing and bitterness. We got to scroll over to the other page here and go to the top to get the rest of this. Although I think you probably get the point by now. I hopefully this won't take too long to generate. But you can see right now very plainly what has happened. Somebody has taken the contents of Romans chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, and back inserted them into Psalm chapter 14, verse 3. What does that mean then? That means that whoever put together the Septuagint, had the book of Romans on the table in front of them when they made the Septuagint, which means that the Septuagint was not created, that the Septuagint had to have been written after the book of Romans. So there is no, there, the, the idea that the Septuagint existed at the time of Christ and that Christ and the apostles used it is proven false by the insertion of 48 Greek words, six verses, into Psalm chapter 14, verse 1. Okay? Now, I understand that you're going to have to track with what I'm saying here. I'm trying to make it as clear as I can. So, I already told you, let's go to the Codex Sinaiticus website. So, I already told you that the Septuagint, what people call the Septuagint, is, is an edited, is edited extracts, from Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus, and Codex Alexandrinus, okay? Now, I am going to, for the sake of time and, and space, I'm going to shut this uh, video window off so I can just show you some stuff here, okay? This is the Codex Vaticanus website. This is chapter 14. All, you see here in this section here all these brackets? These are the 46 Greek words that were originally in Romans chapter 13, that were 48 Greek words, excuse me, that are asserted into Psalm chapter 14 in Codex Sinaiticus. Now, I cannot, the Codex Vaticanus website is not as navigable, if you will, as the Codex Sinaiticus website, but the same 48 words are also inserted into Psalm 14 verse 3 in Codex Sinaiticus. And you can see over here that the Codex Sinaiticus website has put these in blue clearly indicating that those words should not be there because those are the exact words that comprise Romans chapter 3, verses 13 through 18 in the book of Romans. And if you come down here, you can see the English translation. Verse 3, all turned away um, as well as become useless. There is none participating kindness. Uh, there is not even one, period. Okay, so that's where the traditional Hebrew reading, if I could find the right screen, that's where the traditional Hebrew reading should end. Right there. Okay. It's right there on the Codex Sinaiticus website. It should end right there at that period. But then you see their throat is an open grave. You see the rest of Romans chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, the 48 Greek words, and the six verses inserted into Psalm chapter 14, verse 3. Okay. 
Here we and and then to make matters worse. So let me get my camera back on here. <clears throat> Let's go back to Psalms and we'll restart the webcam here. Um, to make matters worse, those same forty-six words, those same forty-eight, sorry, those same forty-eight Greek words that are in Codex Sinaiticus that are in the so-called Septuagint are then copied by Jerome into the Latin Vulgate. And then when the Latin Vulgate is translated into the Douay Reims, notice Psalm chapter 14, verse 3 in the Douay Bible. All have declined. They are become unprofitable. Together there is, there is not that doeth good, no, not one. Their throat is an open sepulcher. With their tongues they did deceitfully, blah, blah, blah. So all of the... the all 48 Greek words, all six verses that Paul originally wrote in Acts 20, let's say, some, some, sometime in the book of Acts. I've got so many numbers floating around in my head right now, I'm, I'm trying to keep them all straight. All 48 of those verses, all 48 of those words, all six of those verses that were originally written by Paul ended up in the so called Septuagint. How could that be? If the Septuagint was around in 285 BC and it was used by Jesus Christ and the apostles, how did Romans chapter 3, verses 13 through 18, get into the Septuagint? How did they get into Codex Sinaiticus? How did they get into Codex Vaticanus? And how did they get in the Latin Vulgate and ultimately into the Douay Reims? Now, here's the thing that you need to understand. One of the things, I guess, that you need to understand in all of this is the following. Codex Sinaiticus, Codex Vaticanus contain Apocrypha. The source for the Septuagint that you could buy in the store today or order online is edited readings from Codex Vaticanus and Codex Sinaiticus that contain the Septuagint contains the Apocrypha because the two the source texts that are used to create the Septuagint contain the Apocrypha. Jesus Christ did not identify the Apocrypha as Scripture in Luke chapter 24. And no Protestant accepts the Apocryphal books as canonical. Now, fast forward now to 1970. The Catholic Church put out the New American Bible. And notice what they did. This is Psalm 14, verse 3. All have gone astray. All alike are perverse. Not one does what is good, not even one, period. Notice how the six verses and the 48 Greek words just disappear. There's a lot to consider here, folks. Scripturally, textually, there's no evidence for a B.C. Septuagint. Just none whatsoever. And again, let me commend to you the book, Did Jesus Use a Septuagint by David Daniels, as well as his uh, vlog series, Was There a B.C. Septuagint, to get some of those details. Because there's a lot to consider here. <clears throat> so, going back to the original question, was Jesus reading in Isaiah, I'm sorry, in Luke 4, in the synagogue of Nazareth, was Jesus reading from a Septuagint? No, he was not. And I think the evidence suggests that the Septuagint did not even exist until after the writing of the New Testament documents. How else do 48 Greek words and six verses from Romans chapter 3 end up in a Septuagint, end up in Psalm 14 that was written a thousand years earlier? Something is rotten in Denmark. And oh, by the way, the same scholars that say that your King James Bible is not, that, that you can't rightly say your King James Bible is inspired or that your King James Bible, you know, is the word of God because it's a translation, are the same guys who want you to buy that Jesus and the apostles are quoting from a translation. So, there you have it. I'm not sure how much more clear I could have made it. I'm sure as I think back on this and watch it back, um, which I do do to try to improve uh, how I make these videos, 
But as I watch it back, I'm sure I'm going to be kicking myself because there's three or four things that I forgot to say that I wanted to say. So before we go here, let me just remind you about Grace Life Bible Church. If you haven't already done so, if you would please consider clicking the subscribe button and the alarm button so that you can stay current with the ministry here on YouTube, uh, we would appreciate that. We want to remind you about our Rumble channel. If you haven't already subscribed there, please do so. And check out my new book. My new book just came out this week, The Preservation of God's Word, a, a close look at Psalm 12, 6, and 7. Please check that out. I'll leave a link to that in the, in the description as well as some of the other resources here that I used to make this video. Before you go, please make sure you like this video, leave a comment, share this video, help get the word out about this channel and about this content. And if you've never trusted in Jesus Christ, if you've never believed and relied exclusively on his shed blood on the cross as the only total complete payment for your sin and on his resurrection from the dead, that he was delivered for our offenses and he was raised again for our justification. If you've never believed that and that alone as the only payment for your sin, we ask you to do it today before it's everlasting too late. Thanks for watching this video and we'll see you next week.